Thank you, Donna. Now, to turn to the back of your hymnal, and we will recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, Pastor Ron. Good morning. Good morning. Where is everybody? sleep by nine o'clock. <laughs> wow. I remember those days, but not anymore. It's good to be with you always. Uh, this is a new year. I wish you a happy new year. I, I hope that it will be a happy one for you. I know that all of us have our own particular issues and there will be struggles. I, I can almost guarantee you that. That's part of life. Uh, but the fact is that we, as Christian people, the, the key is that we know that we're not alone, and whatever happens, we'll, we will be, have someone with us who will guide us and give us support and strength uh, that goes beyond understanding. So that, that makes a difference between, you know, Christians and non-Christians, as far as I'm concerned. So I have a pep talk for the new year. Let's first of all read Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been Tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent it and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Raymond, wailing in loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, and an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to the dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. But Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that his, um, I can't pronounce that guy's name, was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee, there he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. So that's the other side of the Christmas story. Happy New Year. Say that again. Happy New Year. I hope things go well for you. I can think of a better way to start the New Year than uh, being together with other believers and worshiping God. I think most of us try to go into the new year with a positive attitude, at least I hope you do. Sometimes it helps if we get a little encouragement, maybe a pep talk to get us in the right mindset. So that's what I have for you this morning. I got a pep talk. There's a kindergarten class in Hill, California, that runs their own free hotline, which is called Pep Talk. P E P T O C. Now, if you want the number, I have it, okay? You can get to me afterwards, and I'll give it to you. 
It's a great way to get inspired by the enthusiasm of children. The teachers who created pep talks said that they were inspired to do so after witnessing how their young students kept a positive attitude in the face of some really hard time. After all, for the past couple of years, these kids have been through the COVID-19 pandemic, California wildfires, changes in family circumstances, and the list goes on. And yet they remain hopeful, positive, energetic. The teachers thought that more people needed to learn from these kids, so that's how they came up with the idea of creating Pep Talk. Now, if you call Pep Talk, you will hear the following options. There's always an option, you know. If you're feeling mad, frustrated, or nervous, press 1. If you need words of encouragement and life advice, press 2. If you need a Pep Talk from the kindergartners, press 3. Now, pressing three option will connect you to a recordings of positive, encouraging messages recorded by kindergarten themselves. Some examples of these pep talks are, bro, you look great. Or if you are nervous, go get your wallet and spend it on ice cream and shoes. You'll feel better. If you need to hear kids laughing with delight, press four. And of course, for encouragement in Spanish, press five. So there it is. You got it all covered. Within days of launching the hotline, these kids were receiving hundreds of calls every day. Great idea to start the new year with advice from children because they often see things with fresh eyes, much more so than you and I do. A few years ago, Men's Health Magazine celebrated the new year by publishing a list of advice from kids. Gabriella, age seven, had this advice for folks who wanted to get in good shape. So here you go. If you want to know how to get in good shape, there's, there's a suggestion. Run around the backyard like the dog does. He seems like he's in pretty good shape. For men who want to improve their relationship with their wife or girlfriend, Charlie Fives had this humorous advice. He said, don't put a blue stick in her hair. It sounds like it's funny, but she never thinks so. Now, I have a feeling that he's tried that, don't you? And for those who want to have more money in the new year, Akai, age five, says, Buy more things that give you back more change. If you have a lot of coins, your pockets will be heavy, and you'll think, I'm rich. It's all about heavy pockets. <laughs> give it to the kids. Huh? I hope that this new year you have heavy pockets and a light heart. Nothing is as over as Christmas when it's over, is there? I mean, when Christmas is over, it's over. The empty boxes, the, the pretty paper on the floor, the stray tinsels from the tree where the cat or the dog played and left it abandoned on the sofa. Life has come back to normal, whatever that is, and it means that the diversions of the past few weeks, the frenzy and fuss, the lights and the glitter are backed away once again like the star on the top of the tree, taken down and carefully wrapped, padded, protected, and put away for another year. What's left? Well, we have a war in Ukraine. COVID is still with us. Homeless people are all around us, sleeping in the floorways, doorways. Hungry people begging for food. Worries about health. Kids that concern us. Jobs that wear us down. We're back to where we left off before the holidays. And we're just one week out from celebrating Christ's birth. But of course, there is always that inevitable letdown. So much was packed into four weeks of Advent. I mean, we could talk about keeping Christmas all year long, but who could handle it? We don't want the, the clogged streets around the clogged mall, mall all year, do we? Who can maintain the pace of, pace of eating? I've ate more in the last couple of weeks than, you know, the kill a horse. I'm still working on that ham. The boy is good, too. In fact, many of us are already planning our diet to begin January 2nd, tomorrow, okay? Or actually, we need a little rest from all the business, don't we? I mean, don't really, after all of that, Mary and Joseph were allowed, however, to rest or even to stay where they were permanently in Bethlehem. And neither can we. It's back to the real world, like it or not. We complain because we have to go back to the real world after Christmas, but our world does not compare to the world of this young family. We have been celebrating these last few weeks. Think about their world. They live in a world where a cruel tyrant 
to order the all infants and toddlers and put to death, and they did. They lived in a world where there were no jets to take them comfortably back to Egypt. They were on the back of a donkey, or perhaps they had to walk. Who knows? Long journey. No other options. Hard, tiring journey for a young mother, a child. They lived in a world where even after Herod's death, they could not be certain that they could be saved. Read the story. Herod's sons were worse than he was. It could be possible, or bad anyway. Over the weeks of Advent, we celebrate the prophecy of Isaiah. When Messiah comes, Isaiah said the world will have light and love and peace and joy. The faithful will be singing the light, or Emmanuel, God with us, will be born. And he was born. And the world was forever changed. But what now? Where is all the light, love, peace, and joy when Christmas is over? Well, as the Church of Jesus Christ, it's us. This is our calling. We are continuing the task of shining Christ's light into the world. It's up to us. Just think about the, the benefits of light. A lighthouse steers ships away from the rocks, correct? A light bulb lights up a room. A small candle can bring light to a very large room. Christmas Eve, just the one little light that just kept increasing and just lit up the whole room. Visitors in the far north tell us that a candle properly reflected can heat an entire igloo from below freezing to above 45 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little bit of candle. Have any of you have been to the, the cave over to Hanover? A lot of you have. I remember going there a couple of times, going back when I was, I don't know where they do it anymore, but back then they, they would take you back there so far, and then when it was really dark, then he'd turn out of his thing, and then it just, you couldn't see anything. And he'd just light it one little bitty can or I don't know, just a batch, and it just lit up the whole, just changed everything. Just a little bit of light, folks, makes just a difference. They tell us when traveling by automobile through heavy snow and ice, it would be a wise idea we are to, to carry a candle and some matches to keep you warm in case of emergency. They say they can actually save your life. A little tiny candle can be a lifesaver under the right circumstances. So it is that a tiny baby offers light and hope to a world torn by violence. Back to our lesson for today. Immediately following the visit of the Magi, Joseph was warned in a dream that Herod was about to search for the child to destroy him. With this warning in mind, Joseph took Mary and Mary, the infant Jesus and fled into Egypt, while Herod, in his rage of fear and envy, slaughtered all the male children of Bethlehem. What a horrible conclusion to this beautiful Christmas story the slaughter of the innocent. You see, that's the way life is. We in our secure, loving homes need to be reminded from time to time that we do not live in a world of sugar plums dancing in children's heads. We live in a violent world, folks, a world where life can be hard and cruel. The real story of Christmas is one in which good and evil are both shown for what they are, good and evil. That's the kind of world we live in, a cruel world where crime, poverty, drug addiction, gangs, hunger, discrimination, and a host of evil threatens to overwhelm society. We see it all the time. Listen to the news. This evil even invades the kind, secure, happy life that we would provide for those we love. It invades all of society. It's always been that way. John spoke of the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. But the darkness keeps trying. Why? Because it has something to do with the very nature of humanity. Think about it, folks. Herod was going, not going to give up his throne without a fight. The tire like that, I guarantee you, you could be, that was the way it was going to happen. He was not going to go without a fight. Herod was a thoroughly evil and violent man. He was married to ten women. He had 15 children, not 10 of them were boys. As his 10 sons grew up and became men, they were destined to become king, and he knew it. Herod did not trust his sons and accused two of them of treason. 
In the year 7 BC, these two sons were sent back to Rome, put on trial, and assassinated his own sons. And then in 4 BC, Herod also killed his oldest son, the one destined for for kingship. No wonder that Caesar Augustus said of Herod, it's better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. He was a violent man. You may remember that the day, on the day David, Herod died, he arranged for a large number of people to be rounded up in Jerusalem and executed on that day as well. You see, he knew that there would not be any mourners for him, so he arranged numerous executions in Jerusalem at the time of his death so that there would be mourners all around. It's the kind of man he was. There's still Herod's out there, just so you know. So it's perfectly plausible that after he discovered that the wise men were not returning to give him directions to the newborn king's birthplace, Herod would give orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and his vicinity who were two years old and under. This is perfectly consistent with his character. The scriptures are realistic. You see about the human condition. There are evil people in this world, folks. We would rather the story of the slaughter of the innocents were not in the Christmas story. A lot of people like to leave it out, but it's there because that is the kind of world we live in. Boy, I'm a bound bummer, aren't I? Listen, here's the good news. Christmas is God's eternal sign that the forces of evil will not win. It will never happen. Evil may sit for a while on the throne, but not forever, folks. Change can come fast. I mean, think about it. Who could have predicted even two decades ago the sweeping changes that have taken place in the Soviet bloc countries? It's amazing. Still happening, as a matter of fact. You crazy, by the way. A century ago, experts were predicting that people were burning wood so fast that there'd be no trees left by 1920. Well, 100 plus years beyond 1920, the situation isn't ideal, of course, but not that bad. Predicting the future is always difficult. There's only one thing we can be sure of God will win. That's the good news for this Sunday. God will win. The Herods of the world may have their day, but the eternal victory belongs to Christ. And that conviction keeps us moving forward from one Christmas to the next, regardless, regardless of how dark things may appear at times. That's what we do when Christmas is past. We keep trusting God and we take care of those we love, not only materially, but emotionally and spiritually. We love them. We listen to them. We encourage them. We understand that they are God's gift to us, and we treat them with love and dignity. And I have an example. Jesse Jackson tells a story of a visit he made to the University of Southern Mississippi. While touring the campus with a university president, he saw a towering male student, six foot eight inches tall, holding hands with a fidgety co ed barely three feet tall. What economy, six feet eight inches tall and only three feet tall. Jackson watched as the young man dressed in a warm up suit tenderly kissed the tiny co ed and sent her off to class. The president said that the student was a star basketball player and that both of his parents had passed away when he was a teenager and he made a vow to look after his sister. Many scholarships came his way, of course, but only Southern Mississippi offered one to his sister, too. Jackson went over to the basketball star, introduced himself, and said he appreciated the way he was looking out for his sister. The athlete shrugged and said, those of us who God makes 6'8 have to look out for those who make 3'3. Three, three. Don't you wish every young person could have that kind of love for his or her sibling? We live lives of faith and we look out for those that we love. And that brings us to the last thing that we do when Christmas is past. 
to remember the world to whom Christ came and for which he died. Why did Christ come into the world? For one reason and one reason alone. God so loved the world. And that's it. God so loved the world. Christmas is centered in love. Final story. This is a haunting story by author W.B. Freeman. A man was walking down a dimly lit street late one evening when he heard muffled screams coming from behind a clump of bushes. Alarmed, he slowed down to listen and panicked when he realized that he was hearing what he was hearing was an unmistakable sounds of a struggle, heavy grunting, frantic, scuffling, and tearing of fabric. Only hours from where he stood, a woman was being attacked. He froze in his steps, hardly heart bearing to breathe, lest the attacker should notice his presence. But then a strange thought occurred to him. Should he get involved? Frightened for his own safety, he cursed himself for having suddenly decided to take a new route home that night. He had family responsibilities, and one of them became another statistic himself. Family responsibilities. He instantly had the urge to run to a safe place and use his cell phone to call the police. But he could hear the struggle becoming more desperate every minute. An eternity seemed to pass as he argued with himself. The deliberation in his head had taken only seconds, but already the girl's cries were growing weaker. He had to decide, and he had to decide fast. How could he sleep at night if he walked away from this? So he finally resolved that he would, could not turn his back on the faith of this unknown woman, even if it meant risking his own life. No, neither for his bravery nor his athletic abilities, he nonetheless summoned up all the moral courage and physical strength he could muster. And once he had finally determined to help the girl, he became strangely transformed. He ran behind the bushes, pulled the assailant off the woman and wrestled with the attacker for a few minutes until the man finally fled. Panting hard, he scrambled upright, close to the girl who was crouched behind a tree, sobbing. In the darkness, he could barely see her outline, but he could certainly sense her trembling shock. Not wanting to frighten her further, he first spoke to her from a distance. It's okay, he said soothingly. It's okay. The man ran away. You're, you're safe now. A long pause, then he heard these words uttered in amazement. Dad, is that you? Out from behind the tree stepped his youngest daughter. Think about it. What if he had passed by that night? What if he had decided not to get involved? What, what I want to say to you on this Sunday after Christmas is this, folks. We will only have this true spirit of Christmas when we understand that every child on this earth, every child on this earth is ultimately our son, our daughter, or our brother, or our sister. It's good to take care of those we love. However, as people of faith, the Bay of Bethlehem mainly calls us to expand those borders, to understand that the good of every person on this earth is our concern. Every child is our concern. So Christmas is over. The living for Jesus may just be getting started for some of us for this new year. Trust God. Take care of those you love. Expand your love to all whom God sent his son into the world to save. God bless you folks as we begin this new year together. Let us pray. Father, help us to see that we are all your children, that we're all brothers and sisters, that there is evil in this world. And if no one stands against it, it'll last far too long. So help us to stand in those little times that we think are not that important, to stand and say, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Hard for us to do sometimes, Lord, but we realize how important it is for us to do just that very, very thing. We love you, Lord. We certainly need you.